of exim policy in procurement to do this i would like to call mr ajay singh chief supply chain and vice president hindustan platinum mr ajay singh is a distinguished supply chain transformational business leader with an impressive track record spanning over 30 years throughout his career he has exhibited prowess in developing structuring operating and delivering multifunctional tacticals and strategic assignments predominantly in supply chain management currently mr ajay singh is serving with hindustan platinum private limited as vice president supply chain management he plays a pivotal role in shaping and optimizing the supply chain process within the organization his expertise extends across diverse industries including heavy industries and electronics automobile telecom specialty chemicals engineering precious metal i would like to call mr ajay singh on the dais please can we have a huge round of applause i think uh, thanks anik for uh, setting a context on the uh, the trend which is going on uh, in the procurement field i think uh, this is very primitive and i think it rightly said and i think we are practicing across all the domains uh, within supply chain and in the industry basically digitalization and uh, the sustainability part of it i think that sustainability uh, is going to play a very vital role and we being a Uh, supply chain experts uh, and the procurement expert where we are dealing with our uh, partners across the globe uh, we need to have this uh, things uh, in our mind at how we are transforming from scope 1 to 2 and 3 because one scope 3 is really critical for all of us to uh, to adhere and where the partners uh, including the end tier of their supply base has to be drill down it is very tedious job i think the industry uh, we are the early movers and being a from metal industry we started this journey and our target is 2035 to have the scope 3 and uh, being in this journey but the uh, topic is different another topic i'll be covering today the role and impact of exim policy on the procurement i think uh, in a day to day life of uh, procurement person we are do- dealing with uh, negotiations uh, international movement of cargo Uh, logistics bits and pieces but one thing i wanted to uh, uh, bring into the notice and i want that people should uh, uh, people are here so take care of how the exim policy is really impacting your procurement decisions uh, whenever you are doing it is not like a part of supply chain and exim team is taking care out of it uh, you as a pivotal uh, uh, role playing in the within the organization is part of also to take care of your exim policies uh, so uh, the these the concerns what will be there right that will be talking about how what are the exim policy right the exim export and import policies when we talk about is in a generic terms basically objective being there for the uh, governments let down the rule within the country uh, for restrictions of goods uh, whether it will be at what length it will be coming into the country what uh, duty structure has to be there uh, fixation of the norms fixation of the policies across because one thing we need to keep in mind that though we last 4 5 years after the covid we are talking about china plus strategy into india but in spite of that no country is self sufficient we have we are dependent on each and every country because of abil requirement of materials example metal metal uh, in india or asia pacific we have to source from either russia or african countries or australia so the interdependency goes on same way like many countries are dependent on the material which flows from india to other countries doing that we need to have this every country has a policies uh, there are a lot of sanctions comes into the picture i think being a procurement professional we need to also see it what are the sanctions currently being there suddenly some war get erupted whether it is a russia ukraine war or whatever the wars are going on and then the policy changes there are a lot of anti dumping duties a lot of restrictions come into picture so being a procurement professional we should be aware of what are the policies are going on across globe and what is the best benefit for you as a organization i think that is very important whenever you are dealing in any industry whether it's auto chemical metal any industry you representing you need to have a very wide thought of processes being there in your organization to adhere to all the system so 
there are certain objectives are there uh, for with, through which the exim policies are being uh, drilled down or being uh, worked out by every country so if you see it like it was especially for expo uh, for a benefit of exporting growth of the country and uh, there are various objectives are being kept so that minding that okay you are uh, you are taking care of uh, whether diversifying your exports whether in terms of whether within the within like uh, uh, all the continents or maybe specific to the uh, the country where your products are being targeted there are various factors being there whether it is like um, even nowadays the uh, smes are also being encouraged to do uh, the exports market into that and i think a lot of smes i was other day participating in uh, sme forum discussion on the it and its services how they are uh, being involved into that i think and it was a very learning curve for me also knowing that almost 20 to 30% of the export services currently being done on it and its is a, is a part of the smes what we they are really working on that and that is where i think the lot of supports are required and uh, uh, we this is being also being there to strengthen the infrastructures uh, within the country and how that can be help out to uh, providing the exports uh, incentives because i'll be talking more on the three part of the the incentives i think that is very critical for all of us to know about it sticking to the uh, still the objective uh, the it also be there that lot of uh, foreign direct investments are being there so that at least you will be uh, the countries can take care of those activity uh, across across the domain and the industry where i think it deals with the export and import policy of the government uh, i think the one subject i wanted to touch with is the sustainability part of it where i think uh, with with the help of all this uh, the policies i think government also trying it to build up a part of the sustainability movement i think we all aware of uh, the packaging the way this uh, extended uh, epr systems has been coming into the play very vital role i think we you all should understand and should take a note of it that what is the responsibility of us as a exporter or maybe manufacturer that how we are supporting the cpr movement across because there are a lot of things are there into this uh, the three topic i'll be talking very uh, very clearly today is one part is the fta free trade agreements second is the advance authorization that advance licenses and third part is the epcg schemes i think epcg and advance authorization you must be aware of knowing it very but i'll go on a little bit more on the free trade agreements uh, which is very useful for a procurement professionals to understand this thing because india being india has signed in last 10 to 12 years lot of fta's more than 30 countries fta's being signed and the recent ones like from within india australia india uh, in european we have uh, signed a free trade agreement with norway switzerland uh, and uh, in 2020 2022 it was signed with india dubai then we have old ones uh, is from indo japan and then we have a safta afta why i am talking about this is basically we as a expert in procurement we are dealing with the international procurement and you being a vital nerves always there is a pressure on cost on you to <laughs> optimize the cost structure right every time and this schemes are really it is benefit for for you to take a note of it because uh, entire duty structure is is advantage to you except the igst because igst is a part of neutral you can take a benefit of igst so entire going from 10% duty structure 5% whatever duty structures are there entire duty structure your your aidcs and all the stack structures are are being their advantage to you so there are i think i'll i'll suggest every one of you to go to the government site www.commerce.gov.in and see the advantages of fta agreements between the countries and if you are importing from those country whether your products the raw materials is falling into those hs hs category and you can take advantage out of it because many a times i have seen it being i also gone to the same journey and many of times unknowingly knowingly we skip those things or we pay on paying on so much of duty structure and this is the value adding to your cost for the organization and the uh, it is it's not advantages for you 
to beat in a in a negotiation terms on the organization so it has advantages of uh, economic opportunity you have a market access because you have advantage on cost competitiveness across globe then you have uh, lower prices because fts gives a lot of advantages 25 to 30% advantages of in the, your input cost uh, within my organization i am seeing it in various agreements we are taking advantage whether india uae india japan australia south korea and i think we are competitive enough across the globe because we are the second largest uh, metal refiner in the world uh, you must, many of us will be not knowing that within sitting in india we are the second refiner of the metal uh, in the world after after the company uh, based in europe and uh, we have a cost advantages because of uh, the the way we treat the fts and advantage to us and I encourage all of you to go a little bit more on this and walk and see it whether something is really relevant for you to take advantage out of it. Uh, second part is advanced authorizations. I think uh, many of you must be working on the advanced authorizations. Uh, one, uh, one thing which I wanted to convey here is uh, it is not just not like a policy or maybe a certification where it is advantage to you. Uh, whether the, uh, the FTA one is a part of your, whether you are selling in a domestic or export, it is irrelevant, right? But here it is a part of where if you are exporting uh, your product to the outside world, there you have advantage of this advanced authorization where you have certain norms, fixation, like we call it science, standard input, output norms, and you have a validity of those licenses where you can act upon to take advantages uh, of your product into the global market. That is where you have uh, duty-free imports, you have a policy like global competitiveness, all the structures are there where it supports your uh, final product into the market where I think your organization can really uh, be in a cutting edge because day by day the cost optimization and cost reduction policies are there because in every organization being in B as when we go and procure, we also go into that way, same way for other companies when with their customer to us, they also go in the same phase of life. Whether there are a lot of flexibility in input sourcing because you have a, a less documentation uh, processes into this and you have uh, mandatory export obligation because here you have, it is for the export market, there is an obligation for you to export uh, whatever the imports you are doing it for duty free. So there are certain obligation to fulfill, licenses are valid uh, for 12, 18 months to, and extended to 6 months, 24 months and then you have to fulfill the export obligation. So uh, it is part of the uh, policies where you can have your export market available to you. And the third part is the EPCG schemes, I think Many of you must be working through your exams and other departments, our finance department on the EPCG scheme, and it is very critical for you to know it, how these policies work it. It is not only just a capital goods. You can even, for your jigs, fixers, your cap, uh, spare parts, which is going into the production, is, is for those things also. And it has a larger uh, uh, bandwidth where you have like a six time of your duty saved for six years. So validity is very long, like six years and six time of your duty saved. So that is where I think you can also uh, create and you can see the advantages of uh, this EPCG scheme, which really helps you out to have this because uh, this is a part of like complete wave of your custom duty, basic customs and other custom duties through which we can able to, uh, able to get all the, all the help for you to get this thing. So that, uh, that's where, because uh, uh, I wanted to have these three, three policies of government where uh, within India we can take advantage out of it. I think uh, out of these three, uh, the best way uh, all of you can uh, seriously look into uh, the free trade agreements, uh, which is really useful not only for your, because it's at least less hassle, because you see there is a uh, carrot or rule of 2020 has uh, government has drafted out where uh, the content of the RCB, that like original con uh, value content and qualifying value content of the countries, uh, so it is close to around 35%. So definitely any country who are producing these goods, 
definitely this would have a content more than 35% of it and definitely this carrot or rules are being followed very diligently where you need to uh, declare those things or whether this has, can be taken part of it. So I'll uh, really urge, uh, request all of you to go to the site of the government, look into the policy because every time you should not be dependent on uh, either your finance team or your exim team for doing it for you, you as a procurement specialist. Uh, should be aware of the policy available across the world for you and uh, you can definitely take advantage out of it. Uh, so these are the three, three things I think uh, it's there. Uh, uh, any questions is there? I think I have, I have, this is what I wanted to present very crisp on the three policies. Uh, if anyone has any, any questions on this, um, I'm very Please do it, at least give a feedback to you of your questions, or if nothing is there, then we can meet sometime and then we can, yeah, please. Uh, what is the percentage of export uh, obligations that government usually keeps in? On which policy you are talking about? The previous policy, we are talking exam policy. So FTA, there is no uh, no binding because only conditions are that the RCBs and QVC has to be made for 35%. You can use it, your product for domestic sales or an export. Uh, advanced licenses, yes, you have an obligation to fulfill uh, your uh, export obligation completely, whatever you have, because there is a standard input output norms fixation is one to one or depending upon your product. Generally, it is fixation to one, to one is to one. So, whatever uh, the inputs are required, the same thing export uh, obligation has to be there. Whether as in the EPCG scheme, you have whatever the duty you have saved is valid for six years and six times. Like, suppose in a in a, in a duty you have set for 1 lakh rupees, so 6 times means 6 lakh rupees, within 6 years you have to export the goods out of, out of country. So that is what the obligations are there. Thank you. Yeah, please. So in case of FTA, uh, like Japan, we have a free trade agreement, but we have, uh, you know, suppliers from Japan they are not registered with their, uh, the Japanese government, so that's why they are not able to pass on the, the benefits to us. So is it a fact or they're just they are? No, one thing is, uh, I think one thing we need to be very careful on it. Uh, uh, there are mutual uh, recognition agreement being signed between India and Japanese government, right, uh, apart from that. And one beautiful thing, I think, apart from these policies, I also urge that, okay, if your companies are AEO registered, like AEO compliant with the TR1, TR2, or TR3, there are MRA with the Japanese government where they can, they will be onboarding your supplier if they are not willing to support, they have some issues, so they will be in part of MRA. Japanese government and commerce ministry there, finance ministry there, they will be onboarding the supplier on this uh, FTA agreements because that is where, because we, have, uh, our organ, uh, organization was audited by, uh, within MRA uh, from Japanese government and that is where the, this discussion point came that many of the suppliers are not willing to supply. So that is where this, I think, MRA mutual recognition agreement comes into the picture where the suppliers can be onboarded, will be onboarded on this uh, agreement and they can, you can take advantage out of it. A second part is that where, that is where the corridor rule came in 2020, uh, where the, uh, the RBC and QBC rule came that, okay, if local content of 35%, they are uh, locally, they are using it for making the product, they are qualifying it for the, uh, for this FTA. It's a TDS process. I'll not say TDS process, but this is the, uh, I think, part of the onboarding process where we need to be, because it is a long relation, because you are going to take it, you are, you are the only one going to take the advantage out of it, right? So, so there are ministries, websites are there where I think uh, India Customs, uh, International India Customs, government uh, body, they will, they, they definitely they are supporting in this movement. So you can go to the AEO team and they are supporting us in these programs. Right, thank you you to please stay back on this stage and to do the felicitation I would like to call Mr. Senthil Arasu from HDFC Life. Can we have a huge round of applause for Mr. Ajay Singh.